In the Hearts of Men, by Prozer One Three Two, Chapter Seven, Reason. Aster entered the drawing room, ears twitching contentedly, a bit of a spring in his step. Nick chuckled behind him, which Aster was gracious enough to ignore. A visit between friends, he'd been reliably informed, should not be spent scolding one another. Apparently, of course, Raster didn't have any other friends quite like Nicholas Saint North. He took a seat across from Nick's oversized armchair and grinned. Not sleep, he said, just drained to the room around them. Much better with less red. I've been trying to tell you for centuries. It was the one room in the workshop Aster suspected that wasn't done up in some terribly clashing red and green color scheme, largely green and bronze, with only the occasional red accent in knickknacks and wall hangings. Your hash! Nick grumbled, taking his own seat. Between them was a table, heavily laden with the tea and Biggie's Nick favored, and Nick reached over to pour himself a cup. Peppermint by Asta's nose with black tea. But there's a perfectly fine color. Vigorous at the check gets hot pumping and blood rushing. Asta wriggled his nose. You're not wrong, he said, and accepted the cup Nick offered him. But with the green? You have to go with a red orange with the green. I do not know what you are speaking of, Nick said airily. Asta rolled his eyes. I don't wonder what those calls you call a blight, he said, blowing on the tea a bit to cool it. Nick was spooning sugar into his with the steady concentration of a man determined to have the perfect cuppa, but Aster tended to forgo it. He preferred to taste the tea itself, not a sweetened version of it. Do you remember the first bite job you put up? Reckon they're blinded the rest of us. Nick winced and offered up a good-natured, cheapish grin. I was enthusiastic! Aster arched her brow and Nick began to chuckle. Whoa! Aster asked when Nick was immediately forthcoming with what he sounds so funny. It's nothing, Nick said, but the grin had turned concerningly mischievous. Aster had learned long ago to distrust that grin. That's not nothing, you hoed, Aster said and took a sip of tea. Ah, it was one of the blends Aster had given him last Chrissy. He recognized the taste. Come on, out with it. It's nothing, North insisted, still grinning. Only... Ugh, whatever it is, you're going to drag it out long as possible, aren't you? Aster said, rolling his eyes and lifting the cup up into his mouth. You look very much like Jack sometimes, Nick said, and Aster made the mistake of breathing in the tea instead of drinking it. After a few seconds coughing fit, during which Nick laughed merrily and Aster glared his solid best when he wasn't trying to introduce his lungs to the concept of air, Aster managed to set aside his tea and point at Nick. Family! I knew you couldn't let it lie for too long. As their coat was horribly strangled. We are not doing this. Knowing what? Nick chuckled, sipping his own tea and reaching for one of the glazed shortbread cookies on the plate. I am doing nothing. Merely remarking a resemblance. Lone duck expressions are so curious. Yes? His eyes were twinkling. Aster hated when his eyes twinkled like that. It never went well for Aster's mental well-being. Curious how people begin to act similar when they spend much time together. No, I will break all of your walls and let the elves out, Aster threatened. No, you will not, North said peacefully, secure in his knowledge that Aster would not in fact do that. Aster hated the idiot was right, mostly because the cleanup would be a nightmare. Besides, what would that tell Jack? He asks why such thing happens. No, you stop that. Aster said, tossing his paws in the air. Do not start threatening me like he's my, he's my caper or something. You must understand. I would tell him because he would of course come to it, Nick said. And honestly, he was lucky Aster liked him because if anyone else spent so much of their time smugly satisfied with themselves, Aster would jump them good. I think he came to help because he is such kind soul. He will deserve an answer as to why assistance was necessary. And so I we legal that heavy hearted will be forced to answer. An answer would be that you friend of his aunt had done such grievous damage. You know, Aster said flatly. What do you get over dramatic like this? You start to sound like those romance novels you keep trying to tell me a sound these. Nick clasped a hand to his chest, his face a perfect mask of affronted horror. He asks me to get them, he protested, voice loud and brash with the theatrics. Books get sound in them in Dream Council. I am kind enough to do my friend favor. Baldust, 
Asdor snorted and chanced another sip of tea, swallowing quickly in case Nick tried something else. You are the biggest closer romantic I've ever seen in my life. Sadly, is a close second. Asdor conceded at Nick's completely unfeigned outraged look. Barbara close, you still beat him. You beat us both, Nick said with an accusing finger. As you are currently engaged in case of Omnia visit of- Ugh, oh, don't break out the Latin. We'll do better- No, you stop right now. As to ground, drop it, Nick. Nick's finger didn't drop. Bunny, he said, and Astor knew he wouldn't get out of this conversation unscathed. It has been three years since we imprisoned, bitch. You have been holding it too long. What do you mean? Astor scowled. You should speak to someone, Nick replied sagely, sitting back in his seat and sipping his tea. This is kind of topic should not be pushed off forever. You must speak to someone, else bitterness grows in soul. After his ears split to either side. Okay, now you've lost me, he admitted. Because yeah, I'm making no sense, mine. Not a failing on my part. Aha! Nick said, voice flat, but a smile curling in his lips. First, answer me truly. You are in love, yes? As they twitched. Reckon that's none of your bizzo, he said, knowing he'd already lost. He'd probably lost three years ago before he'd even figured it out. Nick always had no more about Aster than their short friendship, only five centuries, something like that, should have allowed him. Bunny, what was unclear about truly, Nick said, sounding irritated. Good, the last thing Aster wanted to do right now was talk about this, and this was the second to last person he wanted to talk to about it. Please, old friend, Aster rolled his eyes, and with a twinge of discomfort came in. Yes, all right, yes. Nick nodded, looking pleased once more. Is as I suspected, he said and reached for another biscuit. I don't know if a dozen you'll be as big as the humans say you are, Aster muttered. Perhaps, Nick replied, though utterly unperturbed by the thought. We'll be all muscle, though. Aster snorted. If Nick was all muscle, then Aster was an overgrown rabbit. Second, Nick added, and Aster groaned again. You love ones, yes? Aster sucked in a breath. Aha! This was the point Nick was aiming at then. Likely, anyway. Aster might get out of this less battered than he'd thought he would. Aye, Aster agreed. So it's always been for old Puka, all the way back since the stars kindled and the galaxies took the first breaths. For each of us, one world. For each of us, one love. The old words sounded strange in English, and Aster wished faintly that he hadn't been such a jealous keeper of his own culture of the last pieces. Not for the first time in the centuries since he'd become a guardian, he considered the possibility of teaching the others. None of the secrets, none of the hidden things that were meant for Pook and eyes and no others. But the language had never been secret. Sam, you could write it well enough, even if his shapes looked as if they had been nicked directly from Aster's handwriting. Nick would leap at the chance to know something new, always did the carrier's blighter. Toots, for all that she'd long managed to feign polite indifference, definitely would love to add this language to her impressive collection. And Jack, well, that was its own separate conflict, internal and as of yet unresolved, especially as Sandy appeared to be teaching him on his own. He decided, as he always did, to put the decision off for another half century as Nick responded. And so, at last, to my third point, Nick said. You love Jack. As Dursey stuck themselves down despite his best efforts. He'd known this for three years already, he scolded himself, and there was no question of his own emotions. The way air seemed easier to breathe and his steps lighter, the world brighter when Jack was nearby. It should come as no surprise to hear the words from someone else's lips. Oi. Aster said at last, and was quite unable to meet Nick's eyes, no matter his reasoning. Nick chuckled a bit. Do not worry, old friend, Nick said kindly, and Aster's eyes snapped up at him. You have nothing to fear from my opinion. A fear that Aster had been absolutely unwilling to acknowledge lifted from his soul. He slumped back in his seat, relief like a song reverberating off his bones, and Nick chuckled. We have done since you did, perhaps sooner. Nick said, and Aster shrugged, personal anxieties aside, he suspected. No one could feel like he did and managed to hide it completely. Jack naturally is oblivious. Like the stores for that, Aster said fervently, then winced as Nick's easygoing expression drooped down. Why do you say so? Nick asked, third biscuit already half gone. 
Given that North's cookies tended to be the size of Astor's pa, this was somewhat impressive. You do not think he would respond well? You cannot know until you say something. Astor rolled his eyes. Nick, trust me. He said, reaching for a biscuit himself. I'm not pining hopelessly. I'm just... Old enough. Why? It needs time for what? Astor said practically. If he talked about it like it was something not involving him, if he said no names, it almost became easy to speak of. Time to settle in. A lot of changes in the last few years to give you the good oil. I'm his friend before anything else. I'm not so selfish as to ruin that. Nick frowned. You would not ruin- No, don't. Astor said, holding up his paw. You can't just pile on stuff like this and hope for the best. Timing, your great big bag of hot air, is everything. I am no bag of hot air! Nick huffed. I wish for your happiness. Is that so bad? I want his. Astor said bluntly. Nick's face crinkled up, smile wide, and Astor groaned yet again. No, stop that. And you called me close that romantic pa! Sandy could not candle to you! Nick said, hand on heart again. Back off! Astor said and gulped down his cool tea. That's what's practical. Certainly! Nick said, still looking amused. But he's romantic, nevertheless. A few minutes passed, and Astor began to think that perhaps he was past the worst of it. Those hopes were dashed when Nick said, Go said, for one! What is for two? Stole like dog shine, you won't just let it go. Astor upped, ah, fine, for two. That's a lot for him to deal with. You have said that, Nick pointed out. No, not like that. Astor stumbled then sighed. With me, Nick. There's a lot. Nick's expression grew confused. I got the following. Astor held up his paw, thumb tucked into his palm, and ticked down his first finger. Buzzed off, different species, he said, and mingled his two remaining fingers at Nick in emphasis. Not only that, different species, from different planet. Alien, though honestly I'm older and I've been here longer, which makes all of you the aliens, but I'll let that go. Nick chuckled, which was what Astor had intended, so that was good. Second off, mail. And then Astor paused, even as he ticked down the second figure. Well, Shifter, the physical stuff is a mite more malleable than your species, mind. But I've been male since I was a kid, and I don't much intend on changing that one love or not. Yeah, yeah, Nick said, and Astor got it over his smile, fond and wide. It was good to have a friend who supported him no matter what, even if he was as annoying and smug as Nicholas A. North. And third off, the whole mightin' for life thing in the first place. At this, Nick rolled his eyes, which gave Astor pause. We have heard of concept, great and alien Bonnie, he said, flat but with no little humor in his twinkling eyes. Marriage is even fairly popular amongst our savages. Don't, don't do that, Astor said, shaking his now closed fist at Nick. That's not a woman, and you know that. What did you mean it then? Nick challenged, and if it weren't for the twinkle in his eyes, Astor would have thought him genuinely offended. I mean, we have very, very different lifespans. Astor explained, twitching his ears and annoyance. Mate, crikey, I could live as long as the universe if I don't cock it. Humans, and human spirits, mind, he said, catching precisely what North's next objection was going to be. Do not. When I say, might for life, I do not mean a paw full of centuries and chump change, Nick. You know I don't. I'm billions of years old already, and I look no older than when I was first of age. I don't know if I ever will. The gravity of what he was saying seemed finally to sink into Nick's brain, because the good humor fell away. He took a thoughtful sip of his tea and said, Are you sure? I mean, you looked very different first we met. Shifter, Astor reminded him. My shape is more malleable than you'd think. A mouth? Astor grinned sheepishly. He'd kept this shape for almost four centuries. Well, returned to it. This is mine, he said with a shrug. I was in a bit of a phase when you met me. We'll leave it at that. Bah! You and your secrets, Nick said. His eyes were twinkling again, and he leaned forward. You were wrong on at least one count, old friend. Asder blinked. Which one? Meant for life, Nick said, sipping his tea again. Jack is human, yes, and human spirit. But we are already different spirits than most. You know, well as I, that our classification as guardians is much contested. 
Astor flicked his ear in acknowledgement. That was a debate he hadn't kept track of, as it had begun shortly after the Guardians had begun to coalesce, and was still ongoing so far as he knew. Spirits had no idea how to identify them, where they fit into the power structures and hierarchies that had always existed, so long as there had been spirits. If they even were spirits in the same way anyone else was. Not only that, but all accounts, including his own! Nick said meaningfully, and Aster perked his ears forward curious. Jack has looked precisely the same. No changes, nothing, in 300 plus years. Aster frowned. I don't remember him saying, You are not the only person he speaks to, for all the details, very hard to make that reality. Nick said, sounding very amused. Aster had no idea what that meant, and would have asked if Nick had continued. It was to tooth if curiosity must be sated. He has not aged. He does not age. Aster only nodded because the implications of that in all sorts of directions was enough to make his heart lift and his soul sink all at once. He'd rather let Jack bring it up to him in his own time than try to theorize and muddle through on his own. He'd rather do it with Jack. Since that was rather the point of all of this, anyway, he decided to let it lie. That is not entirely of your hesitance, Nick said gently. Aster groaned again. You're not going to belt up until you get no every scrap, are you? He demanded. Have you ever known me though? Nick said, and Aster had to concede the point, however reluctantly. Please, Bonnie, help me to understand why you put off your own happiness. I'm not, Aster protested. All right, you want the drum? Here it is. I don't want him to feel obligated to me, all right? Nick sat back in his chair. His surprise was visible in the widening of his eyes and the setting aside of his teacup. Obligated? You know, Jack. Aster said, and even the name made his pulse jump always put starlight he had it, man. You know how he is. Kind. Kinder than the world should have made him. And caring. And always trying to help. He thinks he has to help stars help me just to be welcome with any of us. It's taken these three years just to convince him to come in and out the woman as he pleases. Nick blinked. But now that it was coming out, Aster couldn't stop it. And that's me home. That's where he belongs. Even if he's never me partner. Even if that never comes to pass, you will always be welcome where I am. And it's taken me three years from the drop-in as he wants and... Aster sucked in a breath, ran a paw over his face. Which is his own miracle. I'm not so dim as all that to not recognize it. But back to me point, he said when he saw Nick's mouth open. Back to me point, Jack is absolutely the kind of bloke who would hear, Oh, me mate can only fall in love once and he fell in love with me. I should try my best to love him back. And that would kill me, Nick. Better than if you finally skim me for your giant soup pot. Nick studied him, expression grave. I do not think, he said after a long moment, that Jack would do that for just anyone. For you? For his best friend? For first one to reach out to care in his entire existence? Yes, he would. I can't see your concern. Aster wrinkled his nose. Great. He complained. That's a whole other angle I hadn't considered. Thank you, Nick. Much obliged. Not as much as you think, Nick said, eyes twinkling again as they rolled his eyes. I still think you should speak to him, he added, picking up his tea again. On the will, Aster said. Nick almost dropped his cup in surprise. Strength, Nick. I wasn't planning on keeping mum forever, he said, amused. A while, yes, but not forever. Give him a century or two. Time to see this world and what's in it before I say anything. Essentially, Nick sputtered, you are patients of Glacier Bunny! Something I reckon Jack won't appreciate, Aster replied, grinning. Nick began to laugh, began to speak of other things, and mentally, Aster took a deep breath, released it. He had Nick on his side, annoying and irritating and smug and self-satisfied as he was, and that was no small thing. Aster thought of the centuries to come, and basked in the light of his own hope like a winter sun in his chest. Summer in the Northern Hemisphere was quickly becoming a favorite time of year for Aster. Oh, it was still very partial to spring, make no mistake. It was a part of his core, a physical manifestation of change and hope, no matter what his thoughts. He knew what lay closest to his soul. There was even a certain appreciation of winter in him, though that had been growing subtle and unchecked since the dawn of April 14th, 1968. But summer, the Australian winter, though it was always spring in the Warren, suddenly felt like the kindest part of the year. 
After all, the work of spring was past, and winter was largely gentle in the southern hemisphere, though there were, of course, certain places where winter took up residence. Great lines of snow all down the South American mountain ranges, the southern tip all but white, and Antarctica was, as ever, the summer stronghold for many migratory spirits. Jack, while migratory in nature, was not one of the ones dependent on the cold to survive, and so had much less to do during the northern summer than he did any other time of year. Now, five years on from pitch, he spent the majority of that free time in Astor's Warren. There was little Astor could think of that would make his chest swell up in pride more. He had made Jack welcome here, had made of his home somewhere Jack wanted to spend time. The Warren, though constructed with his own solitude in mind, had never been truly designed for it. It, like him, was built for a partnership, for more than one in residence, no matter how briefly in the year. There were stories, things that Astor had long ago dismissed as lost to him with the loss of his species, stories that now reared up and reminded him of who, of what, he was. His own magic was responding, weaving around this addition and the change in himself, and certain things were locking into place. The wards, even the ones Astor had built to allow only himself in, rooms where the last artifacts of his civilization rested in stasis untouched for millennia, had altered to welcome in Jack, if he should try to enter. Astor was uncertain if that was just a side effect of how the magic worked, or his own subconscious decision. If he'd thought about it, or if Jack had asked, he would have let him in, he realized. He wanted to share this with him some day, the histories and technologies and philosophies. He wanted to know about Jack's history and experiences and stories. He wanted... He wanted, and the Warren changed to suit that, to accommodate two, where its builder had given up the thought of anything more than one. There was a certain amount of chagrin towards himself that he had assumed so. It wasn't as if Puka had only ever partnered with Puka... Cross-species relationships were commonplace enough that no one had blinked at them, though there was always a tinge of pity, a sense of tragedy to those. After all, few species lived so long as the puka. Someone who fell in love outside of the species was practically doomed to lose them. Astor's conversation with Nick, two years old by now, still weighed heavily on him. The implications of Jack's existence, what a spirit even was. Certainly, there had always been stories and myths and legends for every species, but prior to this planet, Jack had never heard of this sort of creature, the transubstantiation of being to new type of being. That he was considered one of them, he checked. The debate was currently favoring spirit rather than immortal magic users, which had been tipped by the addition of Jack to the ranks, was a bit boggling. He was alive, wasn't he? He bled and he breathed and time passed, even if not for this body of his. There was a hope in him, small and wavering, that he only acknowledged peripherally. That for him just maybe falling in love out of his species wasn't the tragedy he'd always heard it would be. That Jack would... That Jack could... Yeah, he'd best not think on it too hard. One way or the other, it was a hope that was too sharp-edged to entertain. He'd gone back into his books and his histories a lot in the past few years. He'd had good reason to bless the Pugin sensibility more than once over the course of his lifetime, and the common practice of keeping a large archive of that sort of thing when they took on a planet was one of the things he thanked most. Yes, the Puka were finished in the long run. He was well aware of this being the last. When he carked it, it was done. But the histories, the secrets, the ideas they'd had, and the things they'd discovered, they were all preserved safe here with him. A twinge of the old grief, but nothing more. It had been a long time. He was largely at peace with it. Besides, a grief so old and well-worn it couldn't compete with the newness, the sweet brightness that was his life now. Now, when he spent a full three months of the year in near constant company with the one person he never thought he'd... Hey, Aster? Aster blinked, took a quick squiz around himself. Ah, he'd done it again. It was easy to get lost in his own head when he was gardening. Emotions were so dear and familiar, he could do it almost without thinking now. Strange, though, to do it when Jack was here, pale fingers gentle on leaves and stained with the dirt beside him. Then again, he'd been thinking of Jack in the first place. That would explain it. Frostbite, Esther prompted when Jack was quiet for a long moment. 
Jack sat back from the dirt, and Aster looked over at him, concerned like a cold tile, when he saw the complex expression on his face. Aster knew he was a long, long time off from even halfway understanding everything about Jack. For all that he carried off the air of a carefree young man, unfettered and free of depths, Aster knew otherwise. Like the strata of cloud formations, there were layers and layers upon layers to Jack, paper thin and mile thick by turns, and Astor thought that even if he did get to spend the rest of his life learning them, he would never complete the study. Even so, Astor was learning, and he could spot the most basic of shapes, he was certain. Anxiety was in the tight line of Jack's jaw, apprehension in the crinkles at the corners of his eyes that only appeared when he was frowning. His blue eyes were shaded, but Astor was unsure whether that was to do with the angle of his head or some other heavier emotion. Can I... Sorry, this is going to sound weird. Jack began, then stumbled back, having some trouble with what he wanted to say. Astor flopped his ears in Jack's direction, withdrawing his paws from the soil and shaking the excess back onto the dirt. Maybe. Aster said, knowing better than to just deny what Jack thought. But reckon I'll want to hear it, weird or no. Jack sent him a glance, and still the layers were thick. Aster still gleaned gratitude from them and felt warm. Okay, Jack said, bit his lip, white teeth like a flash of ice, which Aster ignored with a great aplomb. Wasn't his place to notice that, not yet. Took a deep breath. Can I talk to you about my memory box? Aster's heart stopped. He knew he was staring at Jack, and that wasn't good. Jack would read it as a negative if Astor didn't pull himself together, but he had all the words of a blank book at the moment. Jack just kept looking at him, though, and Astor felt a flare of pride. There were nerves, yes, and anxiety, but Jack was holding on. Determination was a light in his irises and a set to his shoulders, and he was waiting for Astor's answer. I'd be honored if you want to. Astor said at last, knowing it was a bit more raw than he'd wanted it to sound, and incapable of hiding it. Jack's smile was small, tentative, but there, and Astor was so in love it made his chest ache. Thanks, Jack said, and sat back fully, folding his legs crisscrossed with grace. He was like a birch tree, sharp bone and thin flesh and pale skin, and Astor swallowed back his sigh before it could make so much as the smallest vibration in his own. I'm a... Wanted to talk about it for a while, but I wasn't sure how to ask. Just like that, Frostbite, Astor assured him, reaching over and allowing himself a comforting pat on Jack's arm. He sat as well, turning to face Jack more fully and set his arms on his knees. How did they? You just ask. Might not have the answer, mind, but I'll always have the time. Even at Easter? Jack did smile, growing a little. Astor chuckled. Might be a bit less then, but I'll make the time anyway, he said, certain. Even for a dumb question? Jack pressed, still grinning, but voiced a little more serious. Not sure there are dumb questions. Astor shrugged, scratched at one of his ears with a high paw self-consciously. Other than the question you already know the answer to, and are only asking to be difficult. Jack tilted his head in acknowledgement, but his smile had firmed. His cheeks had gone a little pink. Astor reckoned Jack had no idea what he looked like, the effortless grace and fetching blushes and sunny smiles and twilight eyes. Silver air that took on the color of whatever light shone on it. Aster rather thought if he did, he wouldn't smile at Aster in such a way, like Aster sat in the heart of the sun. There was still a hope in his chest, one that Aster didn't dare to either tend or uproot. Time, he chanted in his head, to all things their seasons. Okay, so, Jack said, smile dropping away a little. You know that I'm, I didn't remember much, right? I thought you were missing your memories, Astor replied. I thought you didn't know who you were. Still fuzzy on the details of that, but reckon that's to be expected. Well, you're not wrong at all, so there's that, Jack said, looking a little relieved. I just kind of woke up one night, right? And the moon told me my name is Jack Frost, and that was kind of... It! Astor had known this, but to have it put so nonchalantly like it didn't matter... I'm sorry, Astor said, reaching out and petting Jack again. Jack leaned into the contact, eyes falling closed, and though it made Astor's pulse leap and stutter, he left his paw there, silent support. It's all right. Well, I mean, I'm still mad about it, and I don't understand a lot of the reasoning behind it, but I mean, it's over. That part's done. Your feelings are still there. Jack gave Astor another grateful look. Yes, they are, he conceded, but I'm not as mad anymore, and it's not as important. 
Aster kept his feelings on that firmly in his own head. His expression clearly changed because Jack laughed a bit under his breath and reached over with his right hand opposite the shoulder Aster's paw rested on. He settled, mist light and cool, on Aster's wrist. It's fine, Cottontail, Jack said, voice soft but certain. It sucks a lot, and I think I'm going to be not okay with it for a really long time. If I'm ever okay with it, he added, brows ticking down. But right now, I'm fine, and that's not what I wanted to talk about anyway. All right, Aster grumped, mostly because it made Jack laugh and his grip on Aster's wrist tightened just a little as he leaned more of his weight over. So long story short, I didn't remember anything, and the memories are still kind of... You know, distant, 300 years of not having them will do that, I think. But they're there, and I remember them, and it's like having a piece of my brain back. Jack's gaze had gone distant, dropping to the dirt between them. But he still held on to Aster's wrist. Aster wanted to take his hand, but refrained. He didn't want to interrupt. I've told Tooth some things, Jack continued, his voice gone a little softer, too, like it was coming from farther away. Not... Not any of the specific memories, really. She just had some questions about how I worked, which I mostly answered, like, I don't age, which is weird, apparently, since North does and Tooth apparently does. Aster nodded, silent, but Jack didn't take notice. It's just really slow for them. Maybe it's really, really slow for me, too, but I don't think it's the same since... Jack swallowed, looked up at Aster, suddenly very present and looking very vulnerable. Aster quashed his urge to type Jack over into his lap and hold him with extreme prejudice. Okay, this might be the weirdest part, and I mean, it's weird, okay, since all of you are apparently, you know, alike, at least like this. What do you mean? Aster asked when Jack was silent a moment. His lips were moving, but no sound came out, like he was mentally rehearsing how he wanted to say it. I'm... I died, I think... Aster's paw tightened, his ears snapped forward. It was like trying to hold a fault line together, but he managed not to drag Jack in and wrap him close, protect him from a danger already long past. You died, Aster repeated slowly, and Jack nodded. I drowned. Thin ice, you know? It was kind of a me or someone else thing. Oh, my little sister. Aster relaxed his grip bit by, by bit and was relieved to see no wince, no change of expression on Jack's face. Good. Aster would be kicking himself if his momentary panic had hurt Jack. So you pulled her out, or... No, I fell through. I got her under the thicker ice, Jack said. He patted the staff beside him, always near but not always in his hands, no longer the security blanket it had needed to be, Aster suspected. That's where I got the Kirk, actually. Fell through with me. I figured that's what the moon saw in me, why he picked me. Aster nodded, eyes on Jack's hand, no longer on Aster's wrist. He missed it already and would have pulled away, thinking the contact finished, had Jack not leaned against the brace of his paw even more when he'd let go. Aster considered the breadth of what he was being trusted with, the fact that he was the first Jack had told, his heart flipping over when he recalled that, and swallowed. So... He said, when they'd both been quiet a moment. Tell me about her, your sister. He clarified when Jack's gaze snapped back over to him. Jack fair lit up, blue eyes gone bright, and his hand returned to Aster's arm, squeezing. Aster felt like he'd been given the world and settled in to listen. Jack wasn't sure how long he rambled about his sister, about his mother and father and the village he'd grown up in. Hours it must have been. Aster was on par with Sandy when it came to being a good listener, it seemed. Maybe not about other stuff. Jack could see him getting really passionate about a debate, green eyes sparking and voice getting louder as he went. That was a bad thought train to be having right now, though, when Aster still had his paw on Jack's shoulder all these hours later. Jack realized he'd been petting Aster's arm, little strokes of his fingers through the soft fur, and almost recoiled before he thought about how obvious that would be. Instead, he dropped his hand to the dirt again, nonchalant, and was pretty sure he'd imagined the disappointment that flared in Aster's eyes. See, here was the thing. Jack didn't have a problem when it came to being in love with Aster. It kind of felt inevitable, like how the world should work, and maybe always was going to. It didn't matter what Aster looked like or who he was, because he was Aster! That was the only important part. 
The problem was Jack. Jack shook the thoughts away. Couldn't resist leaning against Aster's paw again, even though it was already basically the only thing holding him up. Aster had put it there, and had pulled it away. So it had to be okay, right? Sorry, he said and laughed a bit. I've just been talking at you. Kind of rude, huh? Don't be sorry, Frostbite. Aster said, smiling, and the green-yellow light of the woman made his eyes look like they were glowing. Copper burned the green that bright, Jack remembered, and resolved to remember that. I liked hearing about it. It's good that you had that. I'm happy you had that. As Jack grinned back, feeling a little lightheaded, like he was floating. What about you? he asked. Your family. Jack had never seen a flame die so quickly the way Aster's eyes went wide and lost the light. He felt his stomach drop out from under him, and he couldn't help the way he reached out with his free hand, as if to snatch the words back. I'm sorry, he blurted out even before Aster could say something. I'm sorry, you don't have to... Aster's other paw came up and caught his, gray-furred fingers gentle around his. Nope, Frostbot is fine, he said, blinking, and already the light was returning, the expression of surprise softening. I wasn't expecting the question, is all. You don't have to answer... Jack said, feeling miserable, even as his body screeched that Aster was holding his hands had a paw on his shoulder. They were halfway into a hug and closer than Jack had thought they were. And then Aster had an arm around him and was hugging him near, and Jack nearly toppled over himself, but his hands were buried in the thick fur of Aster's back, and he was halfway lying across Aster's lap, but it was okay. Aster was hugging him. It ought to be okay. I won't thank you, great deal. Aster said, his words muffled into Jack's hair, and Jack felt like light had to be pouring out of his skin. I told you, I was surprised. The drama's from my is fine. Jack just held on because he wasn't sure when Aster was going to end the hug, but he sure as hell wasn't going to be the one to do it. Aster shuffled a bit, and Jack's heart fell until he realized, miracle of miracles, that Aster was just adjusting his grip. Jack sat up a bit, and they made it work, huddled close, neither saying aloud what they were doing. Jack wasn't sure if Aster was doing this for Jack's comfort or his own, but with Jack's brow resting against Aster's shoulder and the arms loosely hooked together, Jack didn't care. Well, first off, Aster said, sounding a bit amused about it, Jack couldn't see, tucked in Aster's side as it was. You know I'm not human, right? I think I might have noticed. Jack said, a touch dry, and Aster's laughter reverberated around him, rumbling alongside the dazzle of joy in Jack's chest. Jack had decided shortly after he'd realized he was in love with Aster that Joy was the light's name. He'd tried on a few others, and had been really partial to some of them, but none of them quite fit the variety of stuff that made the light flare up other than happiness, and Joy sounded cooler in Jack's head. It was comfortingly bright at the moment as Esther laughed and Jack grinned in and was fair. Well, reckon you'd have to walk around with your eyes closed, not to notice. Esther agreed after a moment. So now I'm not human. To be quite honest with you. He took a deep breath and Jack could feel the way the air filled his chest really smoothly on a sigh. Well, I'm not from this planet either. Jack paused, wriggled back a bit so he could look Esther in the eye. Aster, who was looking nervous, ears tucked in and mouth tight. So wait, you're an alien? Why? Aster said, watching Jack closely. Like, space alien! Final frontier a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away? Aster rolled his eyes, which was a relief from the nervousness. I think you're mixing a few things up there, but yes, I'm a puka. His paws, set loosely on the flat of Jack's back, tightened a bit. The lost one. That took Jack a second to process. Well, a whole bunch of seconds. It was a big thing what Aster was implying and left a whole lot of questions in Jack's mouth. More important, though, was the sentence that was among them. Jack ignored the nerves in his stomach and pressed near, setting his head back on Aster's shoulder and hugging him tightly. That sucks, he said, because it was the truest way he knew how to say it. I'm really sorry. Aster's arms tightened around him, too, and Jack felt the fur of his cheeks brush over his forehead as Aster leaned down and rested his cheek against the crown of Jack's head. It does it that, Aster said softly. Thank you. Jack just held on more tightly because of the things he wanted to do, nuzzle and pet and stroke and hold. It was the only one available to him. 
I reckon you have questions, Aster said after a moment, when the tight hug returned to the loose almost cuddle from before. Who was Jack trying to kid here? It was totally a cuddle. He was cuddling Aster. He felt like he was about to boy off the ground. About a million, Jack admitted. But I don't know how to ask any of them. Just like before, Frostbite, Aster replied. Yeah, just ask. If it's not the answer you'll be looking for, you can ask a different way. No dramas. Okay, Jack agreed, then paused, trying to sort through the crazy number of questions. Finally, he settled on his original one. What about your family? You can tell me about them if you want. Aster shuffled a bit. Booga were a little different when it came to family. He began slowly. A dam and a sire would have a litter of kids at a time, up to nine in a lot. We tended to be closer with our little mates than our oldies. Jack nodded, thinking that over. Did you get along with them? Course not. Aster snorted. We were a litter of five, closer knit than most. Rugger most siblings fight as often as they love each other, though. Jack made a face remembering his sister, who scrunched that little face with her teeth, the way she'd tattled to their mother when a trick went a little awry. Yeah, that's fair. Aster chuckled. My fault. I love them. They loved me. I've not thought of them for a long time, though. No use to miss them more than I have to. Jack swallowed, that of his own sister long dead and buried, when he'd not even known she existed. It's good to remember them sometimes, Jack murmured, and there was a pause in Aster's breathing. Aye, he agreed. It is. So, come on, Jack said when it had been quiet a moment, grasping for a subject change through the griefs intermingling in the air between them. Alien! Means you've got to have weird alien powers, right? Weird, Aster sputtered. Yeah, Jack said, cheering up a bit at Aster's response. I mean, now I don't know what's a guardian about you and what's alien. Come on, impress me. There was a twitch that ran through Aster's frame, but Aster was already speaking before Jack could address it. Not much comes from the Guardian, to give you the drum, Aster said, sounding right about it. Guardianship doesn't give you any powers, so far as I can tell. Everyone came in with the powers they have, other than the lights. And I reckon we might have had them before then, too. Jack tilted his head back, thinking about it. And I do agree. He couldn't pick out a time when the light in his chest had flickered on. He thought maybe he just hadn't known what to look for. So why have me magic, as does most anyone who sat and read a book for a minute or two. As to continue with the night. What kind of books? Jack asked, because he was curious. He knew his magic couldn't do the kind of things Aster's could, or Nick's, or Tooth's, or Sandy's. But theirs seemed so much more constructive. Even with his better control... And it was so much better than before. He could do almost anything without the staff now, even if the staff made it easier and more powerful. He knew he couldn't make anything like they could. Stories, Asta replied immediately. That's where you start, with stories. Things that make you feel things, make your heart jump and your brain whir. From there, you could get technical. But if you've ever read a story, you could do magic. Nor something you should worry about, mind. Asta said it juggled. Jack, you've got more power in your little toe than most people ever see after lifetimes of study. No good if I can't figure out how to use it, Jack muttered. North might be able to help you, Aster said gently. Unfortunately, most of my books are. Well, you wouldn't be able to read them. Jack nodded. Made sense if they were alien books. Maybe they were written in an ink only Aster could see, or maybe didn't look like books at all. So it's a magic. Aster said, and when Jack looked up, Aster's eyes were turned on him. I could shapeshift. Every book I could. Though some better than most. Jack stared. Okay, that's cool! He said, the words dropping out of his mouth before he could really consider them. Like, how? Magic too? In a sense, Aster said, and there was an expression of relief on his face that Jack didn't know the source of, but was happy to see. I could do it consciously. Into most any living shape you can think of. His face went a little wry. That's why I don't eat chalky all that often. Makes it unpredictable. No, not unpredictable. I could tell you precisely how it will react, but... Wait, you can't even eat your own chocolate? Jack demanded, horrified. Are you kidding? Aster's face was sheepish. Wish I could frostbite, but that doesn't have a good effect on me system. Unless you need it in an emergency. But otherwise, not good for day-to-day -day consumption. Oh man, that's awful! Jack groaned. That's so unfair! Believe you me, I agree with you, Aster said with a bit of a wistful sigh. But the extra arms and the loss of a lot of common sense isn't worth it. 
Okay, extra arms, like snitch. I have no idea what you're on about, but sure. Jack rolled his eyes and nudged Aster in the side with his elbow. Aster returned the gesture with a nudge of his own and a fine look. They were still cuddling. It was wonderful. So, shape-shifting? Magic, Jack said. Anything else, Bun Bun? Time travel, but reckon that goes on the magic, and it's not something I'd do if I could help it. Aster said offhandedly. Jack really, really considered asking, but the thought was not clean out of his head when Aster added, Ah, and the uh, soulmate thing. Though I'm not sure that's the right word for it. The what thing? Jack asked, hoping he'd heard wrong with every cell in his body. Aster shifted uncomfortably, and Jack's heart sank. Burger fell in love once in a lifetime, Frostbite. Aster said, every word precise, like he was weighing it carefully. It wasn't a destined thing, but we did only get the one. And the, well, were effectively immortal, unless the V's or violence made us cock it. So, it was a big part of the culture. Mind you, it wasn't really something I'd dealt with, having never found mine. So I can't tell you more than stories about it. Jack's heart dipped down and lifted back up so quickly that he only just managed to remember Aster could feel hope and shove the thoughts away. In a bit, he told himself, and since it was going to take a little while for him to figure it out all anyway, that was fine. Huh, he said instead, thinking in exactly zero directions other than this conversation. He had to. He could do it. Neat. You learn something new every day, I guess. It doesn't bother you. Aster asked, and Jack jerked. There was a lot of emotion there, a lot more naked than Aster usually let show. More raw and more... More nerves and fear and... No way, Jack said, sure as could be. After all, Aster could be just about anything, and Jack was certain this feeling in his chest wouldn't go away. It might change over time, settle into something that hurt a little less and weighed a little less, ingrained into him at last, but it wasn't going anywhere. Jack knew that in his bones, in the warp and weft of the magic and soul and flesh that made him what he was. I mean, I know more about you, right? That doesn't make you someone new, just someone bigger. Aster hugged him tightly, roughly, and Jack realized just how deeply this must have been bothering him. It had probably eaten at him the way it wanted to talk about his memories had been eating at Jack. Well, not entirely. Aster wasn't in love with him, so it was more of an... I don't want to chase off the skittish friend all over again, Jack suspected. Still, it was scary sharing parts of yourself, no matter what kind. Jack was glad Aster had. The visit went on a little longer, and there was something more fluid in the way they spoke now, some barrier removed at last. Neither of them mentioned the cuddling, which Jack was grateful for, because it meant he didn't have to try and think about the thing he was trying to not think about. It kept creeping in at the edges, but Jack had some idea of how to handle that now. Or practice at it, anyway. Still, it wasn't long until whatever they'd been working on, Jack couldn't tell you for the life of him, what it had been. Weeding, maybe? Was finished, and Jack left, since there was a storm brewing over the southern tip of Argentina that he wanted to keep an eye on. Like leaving the warren was the last straw, the thought finally made itself too loud for Jack to ignore, even as he flew steadily east over the Pacific towards the rising sun. I have a chance! Jack considered the thought, pretending it didn't hurt to hope so hard, and put it aside to focus on the storm. He was pretty sure he needed help working through this thought from someone who was unbiased and might have, if not advice, then some good insights. And there were three people in the world Jack trusted to have a good bead on different situations like this. The first was Aster, of course, but since A, Aster was the source of the situation, and B, Jack would have trusted him with this even if he was terrible at it, Jack was well aware that wasn't an option. The second was Sandy, but the chances of word reaching Aster's long ears before Jack was ready were too great. Sandy was wonderful. He was. But he was also a ferocious gossip. Which left one person. Won't Jamie be surprised to see me in July? Jack muttered under his breath and went to work. I'd make a Christmas in July joke, but I think that's more of a Santa Claus thing. Jack rolled his eyes and stuck his tongue out at Jamie. Jamie mimicked the whole thing right back, which had been endearing when he was two feet shorter than Jack, and was ridiculous now that he was almost half a foot taller. 
had a gangly 13, almost 14. Jamie had grown like a weed in the last year and a half, and it was like his bones had decided to go right ahead and do their thing without giving the rest of him time to catch up. His voice hadn't yet begun to change, but his face had taken on some more adult lines and fun-loving or not. Jack was beginning to see the way he would look as an adult as he grew older. Jack was just relieved that he didn't seem to be losing his belief as he grew up. Though Jack supposed growing up didn't always necessarily mean that you didn't believe in things anymore. It was weird to think that someday soon, Jamie would look older than him. And it hurt to think that someday his first believer, this great and wonderful kid, would... Oh man, best not to think about it until he had to. Can't I just want to say hi during the off-season? Jack said, taking a seat on the windowsill. Got a lot of free time right now, kiddo. Uh, Jack, I'm not a kid, Jamie said exasperatedly. I'm a teenager now. Jack snorted. Okay, Mr. Big Shot Teenager, he said and wriggled his fingers. Gentle snowflakes began to fall on Jamie's head, and Jamie's sigh of relief was so exaggerated, it made Jack laugh all over again. Shut up, Jamie said, flopping onto his bed. He'd started wearing his hair longer in the past year, and it flopped into his eyes, where it wasn't tied back into a little ponytail at the nape of his neck. You're not the one with a broken AC. I'm dying. I am an AC, practically, Jack said, and dumped some more snow on him. Jamie just rolled around in it, unheeding of the way it soaked into his bedspread. You should come visit more often in the summer, Jamie said. Not that it's not cool to see you in the winter, but summer could definitely use... There isn't even school to use a snow day to get out of, Jack pointed out, very sensibly in his opinion. Jamie looked shiftily away, and Jack squinted at him. You're in summer school again, aren't you? It's not my fault, Jamie said loudly, sitting up. It's Miss Demon's fault. I passed her class fair and square, but she told my mom I was underperforming for my grade level. Here Jamie's voice became nasally and I pitched, tried to imitate the teachers, no doubt. As a mom signed me up for summer school English classes. Last year, it had been math, which Jamie had been struggling with, but for a long time, English and science had been his strong points. Jack frowned. Underperforming? She kept failing me in the creative writing assignments. Jamie said and looked miserable about it. I thought they were okay. I don't even really like them. But she said they were unrealistic for someone my age. Mama agreed. So now I'm sitting at Zimmer School because I was writing about... Jamie paused with a little red. What? Jack asked, holding his head. He had no idea what Jamie could have been writing about to get them so fired up, but it was Jamie. It was probably aliens or something. I was writing about... You guys... Jamie fessed up at last. Jack jerked, surprised. Like, it wasn't my idea, Jamie added hurriedly. It was Monty and Pippa's. We all were, right, we were bored and having a contest, and Caleb won by landslide because that dirty cheater made Tooth fight off like an entire army of demons, but I was the only one in English at the time, and it seemed like an easy A if I'd already written it, and... Whoa, wait, Jack said, and Jamie snapped his mouth shut. Sometimes Jack wondered if maybe somehow through the years... Maybe somewhere way down the line, he and Jamie were related. At times like these, he was almost certain. You were writing? About us? Yeah! Jamie sighed and flopped back over. Gingerly, Jack picked his way across the room and sat down next to him. Another shower of snowflakes dusted Jamie's hair. Like I said, Monty and Pippa's idea. They thought it would be a cool way to spread the word, you know? Stories! Something Aster had said flashed in Jack's mind, and he reached over to ruffle Jamie's hair, who would have whined about it any other time, but just pressed into the cool touch given the heat of July. I think it's a great idea, Jack said, and Jamie blinked his eyes open. Really? You don't think it's, I don't know, kiddish? Jack laughed. Know what Bunny said to me the other day? He asked, and Jamie sat up. The kid had a big soft spot for Aster, who he thought was the coolest, right after Jack. He had assured him one time, since Aster couldn't make it snow inside. He said that anyone could learn magic. Anyone who had sat down and read a book or two. Jack said, paraphrasing, a bit. Jamie's eyes lit up. What kind of books? He asked, and Jack grinned. Oh, yeah. He was going to have to borrow Jamie's computer one of these days. There was no way they weren't related. There had to be records of that kind of stuff. Everything was on the internet these days. Stories, Jack said in answer, and grinned as the bright light in his chest went just a tinge brighter as Jamie began to smile, too. Stuff that makes you feel stuff, you know? 
Apparently, after that, you can get technical, but you gotta start somewhere. So I bet rioting stories is, like, twice as good. You think? Jamie said, and even though he was smiling, his voice was small. Definitely! Jack confirmed and hugged him. Jack still wasn't great about letting people into his space, but for Asta and Jamie, he could always make an exception. It was kind of weird to hug Jamie now that he was so much taller, though. Well, it doesn't matter, Jamie sighed, pulling back. I'll just get through it. Plus, I start high school this fall, so I won't have to deal with Miss Demon ever again. That's the spirit, Jack said and dumped some more snow on him. So why did you come to visit? Jamie asked and flopped back onto his bed, hands lifted and swirling the falling snow side to side. Because you had a look on your face when you came in. Did not, Jack said, frowning. Did you? Jamie returned. That look, right there. What's up? Why are you worried? He paused. Is, is Pitch back? Whoop! No way, Jack said, rearing back. Oh, man, no way. He's lined up good and tight. Don't worry about that. Jamie relaxed a bit. Okay, then come on. Spill it, or I'll get Sophie to make you spill it. Or Cupcake! Jack's shuddering was only a little bit exaggerated at the last one. Cupcake had big eyes and could sit on him, holding him in place. Sophie, he could escape. Cupcake? There were no secrets from Cupcake. Once she knew someone had a secret. Yeah, okay, fine, Jack said. I came here to talk to you about it anyway. Me? Jamie said, looking over. Oh, man, it must be bad if you're looking for help from me. It's not bad, Jack said, mulling it over. Maybe it was a little weird to talk to Jamie about this. He was 13, after all. But then again, Jamie was basically the most sensible person Jack knew. Jack knew Nicholas St. North, so that wasn't saying much, but... I don't think it is. I mean, I figure you'll tell me if it's a bad idea, right? Are you planning a prank? Jamie asked, brightening up, and Jack immediately resolved to include him on the next one in thanks for this, if just the idea made him that happy. No, no, Jack said, and Jamie groaned disappointedly. Next time, promise, but... Jack bit his lip and decided that as to the advice of just saying stuff, that would probably work best. Okay, so I'm a... Uh... Deep breath, Jack, saying it aloud is like the first step to figuring it out. So I'm kind of in love with my name, and I'm thinking about saying something to him, like, about it. So, bad idea, do you think? Jamie was silent a moment, and Jack looked over at him, concerned. When he saw Jamie's face, he winced. Wow, that wasn't a good face. Come on, Jack, Jamie said, looking flatly annoyed. Pull the other leg while you're at it. I know you two are spirit married or whatever. Jack took a second to parse that out and then blurted it out loudly. What? Jamie's eyes went so wide, Jack thought they'd pop right out. Oh my god, you're serious? Of course I'm serious! Jack said, clutching his staff up to his chest, staring at Jamie. What the heck kind of joke is that? Don't start with the not swearing thing. You know I heard you half of the time anyway. Jamie said distractedly, but Jack could feel a slow, blooming, bright joy beginning to bubble away from Jamie's direction. So wait, really? You two aren't married or something? No, wow, well, definitely not, Jack said, but he could feel the way his face was going pink at the thought. Wow, married to Aster. He hadn't even thought of that, but that, that sounded really nice. Mostly, he'd been thinking about what would happen if Aster accepted the way Jack felt, but not even if Aster would turn. On reflex, he shoved the thoughts away, but remembered Aster was off in his warring, unless the hope thing was more detailed than the joy thing, which it might be. Jack had no idea. Best to play it safe, probably. How are you two not? Jamie asked, looking delighted at the idea. Are you kidding? This is hilarious. Everyone's gonna flip. No! You can't tell anyone! Jack said, flinging his hands out in a blind panic and dropping more snow on Jamie's head, who sputtered. What if he found out before I could say something? Jack, oh my god, Jamie said, rolling his eyes and brushing snow off his face. We've all thought you two were married or something since we met you. Jack knew he had to be red because it felt warm all over. What? No way. Jamie rolled his eyes. Okay, well, if you two aren't together, why not? He asked. Jack dropped his gaze. Oh, um, well, I mean, he's not. I don't think he. He was still caught up, though. You guys really thought we were... Of course we did, Jamie said laughing. Oh my god, I know you can't see yourself, but like, you talk about him all the time. He talks about you every time we see you. 
We can ask about Santa or Tooth or Sandy, and somehow it always ends up back around you. And you're really telling me that neither of you... Oh, man, when can I talk lot? He's going to get such a kick out of it. Jack clasped the hope again before it could get much bigger. I don't know, he said and sighed. Okay, look, I honestly was expecting more of a... Yeah, that's a bad idea from you. Why? Jamie asked, holding his head. I can think of a bunch of reasons why right off the top of my head, Jack muttered. Jamie sighed. Okay, well, let's start with the ones I can think of that might be bugging you, okay? He said, crossing his legs and turning to face Jack. That's what my mom says to do. Make a list. Lists help her and me anyway, so they might help you. Okay, Jack said nervously. Well, first off, Jamie said, sitting up very straight and adopting a serious look that kind of made Jack want to laugh. The obvious things. You know Bunny's a guy, right? Jack did laugh at that. Uh, yeah, he said with three chuckles. Kind of hard to miss. I'm just checking, Jamie said a bit flushed. And you don't have a problem with that? Jack paused. No, why would I? I don't know, Jamie said, and poked Jack exasperatedly when he started laughing again. You're like a bajillion years old. People used to have big problems with it. His face took on a pensive quality. Still do, actually. Jack took a second to consider the idea as seriously as Jamie's expression merited. The thing was, 300 years spent as just Jack, without memories of how he was raised, didn't actually have anything to say on the subject other than thinking that, wow, people were assholes about some things, and not really assholes about things they should be assholes about. So Jack could see where Jamie was coming from. However, the 18 years before that didn't actually contradict what Jack had felt or thought when he couldn't remember them. In fact, huh, he wasn't sure he ever liked a girl. He wasn't sure he'd known there were other options. It hadn't been important, and still wasn't, in Jack's opinion. Besides, spirits did it tend to care in his experience. The few times he'd been around others long enough to pick up on things like couple stuff, there were just as many people who didn't have a gender at all as there were people who did. Something the spirit sphere of the world had gotten right, at least. One of the few things they'd gotten right. Jack still felt kind of bitter about a lot of it, so sue him. He'd gotten to spend a big chunk of the last few years not dealing with them, but he knew that couldn't last forever. No, it's not a problem, Jack said firmly. Well, that's good, Jamie said and seemed to deflate with released tension. Oh man, Caleb's going to be really relieved. Oh my god! Jamie slapped a hand over his mouth. I wasn't supposed to say that! Jack smiled. It's okay, he said and patted Jamie's knee. So is Caleb... He likes guys, Jamie said slowly. He told his mom, and she's not happy about it, but she's not being mean about it, I don't think. Claude's got his back, but he's been really nervous about telling anyone else, especially you guys. I think it would make him feel way worse if you guys... I don't think any of us think badly of it, Jack said. I mean, I don't think people like us generally do. Besides, we love you guys. We never think badly about you. Promise to act like you didn't know when he tells you. Jamie demanded. He's gonna kill me if he knows I outed it first. I promise, Jack said and grinned. But I've got blackmail on you now. Ah! Jamie groaned freely and then perked up. Oh no, you don't! I know this thing now! Jack felt his face fall and Jamie's triumphant. Ha! Was like lightning in his chest. Then second, Jamie continued a second. It's obviously that Bunny's a bunny. He's not! Jack said immediately, then cracked yet another grin. He was always smiling at Jamie. Oh man, you're going to love this. Bunny's an alien. Jamie's mouth dropped open. Shut up! No, seriously. Okay, but like an alien? A real alien? Uh-huh. Does he have a spaceship? I have no idea, but wait until he tells you himself, Jack advised. Then you can ask all you like. That's fair. Jamie said, eyes still dancing. Oh man, that's so cool. I didn't think he could get cooler. Right? Jack said, and this time when Jamie flapped down, Jack flapped down beside him, conjuring a light snow above them. Jamie's bed was practically soaked at this point, but Jamie wasn't complaining. So he's not a bunny. He's an alien, which, well, I don't really think that's weird either. He's still a bunny, you know? Oh, yeah, you're in love, Jamie said knowledgeably, and when Jack elbowed him, he elbowed Jack right back. Mom says that when you love somebody, all that kind of stuff doesn't matter anymore. So, yep, you're in real, genuine, bona fide love. Jack laughed. Okay, yeah. All right, but those are the only things I can think of that would make you not want to marry him or date him or whatever. What do you do for a date, anyway? I don't know, Jack said, frowning. I mean, 
We mostly hang out in the warren. We garden. It's nice. Maybe we could just do that and call it a day? No, 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 Jamie said. You've got to do big stuff. That's what all the movies say. Like dinner or a party or... Okay, hold on. We'll talk about that later. Why aren't you two together? Jack swallowed. Um, it's not about him. It's... I mean, I'm me, so... What does that mean? Jamie asked, shrewd, as he squinted over at Jack. Well, I mean, first off, I mean... Jack said, hands flailing a bit above them, snow going everywhere. Honestly, he'd be embarrassed about the apparent lack of control if it wasn't so hot and Jamie clearly didn't mind. I mean, I don't want him to feel like he has to be okay with it. I don't want him to say yes because I'm me. What? He's helped me out so much, Jack said helplessly. I don't want him to say yes because he feels like he has to or I'm going to go back to the way I was or like... Think that I feel this way because he helped me either. Like, when people fall in love with their doctors or the firefighter who pulled them out of the building. Jamie's face was very serious when Jack looked back over. Was it that bad? He asked quietly. Jack hadn't told him a lot of what had happened, sensible and smart or not. Jamie was still a kid. Kids didn't need to hear all the awful details in Jack's opinion, just like they didn't need to be lied to. Jack had told him the generalities of it, if not the memory stuff. He'd wanted to save that for Aster. Aster deserved to know first. Jack swallowed. Yeah, he admitted. It, it really was. Jamie rolled over and hugged Jack again, tight as could be, before rolling back. Way before Jack could make himself hug back, surprised as it was. I'm sorry, Jamie said and meant it. Jack could see it. Thanks, kiddo. Teenager, Jack! So you keep telling me. Jack laughed. I know, I know. But... Jamie elbowed him again. You know Bunny doesn't think that about you, right? Think what? That you... You need saving or something. He told Claude and Caleb and Monty that you're the strongest guardian of them all. Jack went red. What? Yeah, like one time he saw you get rid of a storm that covered like half the continent in under a minute. Jamie said, going a little starry-eyed. Full on blizzard! You saved Easter! Like, he said that he was pretty sure that if Sandy hadn't shown up, you could have kicked Butch's butt all by yourself. Jack felt a bit like a deer must when headlights caught them out. It wasn't half the continent, he said, rubbing his left arm with his right hand. It was just a coast and a few hundred miles inland. Okay, that's twice as cool as the alien thing, Jamie said with great authority. Seriously? Anyone can be an alien. The vice president might be an alien, but you can control the weather. Well... Jack said, mortified. Thanks! So yeah, but he definitely doesn't think that you're, like, weak or whatever you're thinking. Jamie said. He was grinning. Come on, this is kind of fight. What's the next one? You've gotten at least, like, two more, I can tell. Jack rolled his eyes. Why did I think this was a good idea again? Because you have good ideas from time to time. Jamie said sweetly. Jack elbowed him again and was elbowed back once more. Come on, I've got cupcake on spin That is not necessary, Jack said hastily, and Jamie laughed loudly as below the front door opened and shut again. Who are you talking to? Jamie's mother called up. Jamie looked over at Jack and grinned. Jack Prest! He hollered back. Jamie's mom groaned and laughed. Okay, fine. Tell him I said hi. She called up teasingly. Mom says hi. Jamie said to Jack. Jack shoved him. Jamie shoved him back. Seriously? Fizz up! Fine, Jack grumped, trying his best to ignore his nerves. Um, so there's a thing about Aster being an alien? Ooh, Aster! Jamie sang song. Shut it, Brad! Jack laughed. He was usually better about calling Aster Bunny, where the kids could hear. It was just Jamie, though, still. Aster had asked him to call him by his name. No one else. But seriously. Seriously what? Is Bunny, like, actually a ball of energy who just looks like a bunny? Uh, no. Jack said, thinking of how Aster's fur had felt under his hands when they guttled. No, he's real. It's just... Apparently, his kind of alien only loved once. Ever. In their lives. Jamie's face fell. Oh, no. Does he already... No. Jack interrupted because he could feel Jamie's happiness dying back, which was an awful feeling. No, he hasn't. Ever. Jamie frowned. That was a problem. Sounds like he's up for grabs to me. Jack made a face. Oh, man, don't say it that way. It makes him sound like like an apple on a tree or something. Jamie laughed. Okay, okay, 
He said, but seriously, why is that a problem? He only gets one, Jack stressed, ever. And apparently he's been around for like ever, Puka or Immortal or something. So, I mean, he's had all this time and he knows all of these people. And I guess I don't want him to, what? Jamie asked, but Jack hated the way the words wanted to come out. Didn't want to say them. Jack? Wait, waste it on me. Jack! Jamie said, sounding scandalized. Come on! It wouldn't be a waste. You're the coolest person ever. He'll be really lucky to marry you or date you or whatever people like you guys do. Jack shuffled. Maybe, he said doubtfully. Plus, he totally doesn't know that many people. Aster said, sounding like the very thought was hilarious. He, like, knows you guys and us and doesn't really talk to other people? How do you know? Jack, anybody who knows him for ten minutes can tell he's just like Monty. He likes to be a man himself. Jamie filled in a Jack's blank look. It's just how they're made, Mom says. Well, she says that about Monty. She'd say that about Bonnie, too, if she believed in him. So? Jack said, knowing it was stubborn and unable to stop it. So I really don't think he's found a bunch of other people better than you. I don't think he could. You're the best person ever. You even beat Bigfoot. You even beat Bunny himself. Seriously, if he wanted to pick someone for that one love kind of thing, he'd be dumb to not pick you. That's what I think anyway. Jack grinned at Jamie and grinned back. Thanks, Mr. Big Shot Teenager. He said and Jamie rolled his eyes. And then else? Jack sighed. I don't know how to bring it up. It sounds dumb to just blurt out, I love you, right? Right, that sounds dumb. Yeah, it kind of does, Jamie said. I mean, I don't know how to ask out people either. How did you guys ask out people when you were a kid? Jack frowned. I mean, not the way people do nowadays. You just kind of got married, I think. I don't remember people dating anyway, not really. You asked permission from their parents? I do remember that. Jack's heart twisted a bit. I really don't think I can do that here. Did you ask the person's family? Jamie asked, rolling onto his stomach. Yeah, if they didn't have parents, but... Well, then you can ask the other guardians, Jamie suggested. You guys are all like family, you know? So it might be the same. Then you'll know that they're okay with it too, which I think might help with how scared you are. I'm not scared, Jack scoffed, but turned the idea over in his head. You know, that's a really good idea. It's not your fault you're dumb about this. Jamie said with some authority. Everybody's dumb about this kind of thing with themselves. You just gotta go for it. Jack squinted at Jamie. So are we gonna talk about you then? And why you have coming on speed dial? I have everyone on speed dial! Jamie protested, but he was turning pink. Then what's the point of speed dial? Jack pointed out. Jamie scraped together a snowball out of the wet slushy mess and mashed it into Jack's face before it could roll away. You don't get to say anything, Jack! He said, wriggling up into a sitting position. You've been married to Bunny for like five years, and neither of you even knew it. Jack spun a perfect snowball out of the air and caught Jamie square in the tummy with it. Okay, but well you've had a crush on... I can't hear you, Jamie said loudly, stuffing his fingers in his ears. I can't hear you lying. Unfortunately, both hands in his ears meant he couldn't defend from the snowball to the face. I'll meet you outside, Jack said, grinning. Usual place. Jamie asked, grinning right back. Absolutely. Grab everyone else. No snow day. And here Jamie groaned. But I think a bit of a secret snow fight might make everyone's day. Awesome! Jamie said and scrambled out the door before Jack could say anything else. Jack hopped out the window and began to float lazily towards the lake, humming to himself. Always the same song. Maybe Jamie was right. Maybe he just needed to go for it. Plus, Jack thought that if Aster turned him down, they could always still be friends, right? It probably wouldn't even hurt after a little while. And if he didn't, if by some miracle this all worked out, that was in the future, though. For right now, he had a snow fight to win in. Jack, Jack, King of Green. He sang under his breath, the lake and the first two kids, Claude and Caleb, coming into sight. When the leaves all fall, he's still a spring.